Hey, and welcome to HDB at Home. Today, we'll be taking a look at Nikki's interview with the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, and his wife, Caroline. And we'll be hearing a talk from Jemima Haley. But before we're led in a song of worship by the HDB worship team, let me pray. Dear Lord, we pray you'd fill us afresh with your Holy Spirit. As we hear from you, Lord, speak to each one of us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.
the most reverend and right honourable Justin Welby became the Archbishop of Canterbury in 2013. He was previously Bishop of Durham, Dean of Liverpool Cathedral and a Canon of Coventry Cathedral, where he worked extensively in the field of reconciliation. Before he began training for ministry in 1989, Archbishop Justin worked in the oil industry for 11 years, five in Paris and six in London. He's a member of the High Level Advisory Board on Mediation for the United Nations. He's the author of Reimagining Britain and Dethroning Mammon, both published by Bloomsbury. Archbishop Justin is married to Caroline and they have five children and four grandchildren. They're an amazing couple and both of them are doing astonishing work all over the world. We're so thrilled to have them with us today. Welcome to Justin and Caroline Welby, the 105th Archbishop of Canterbury. I don't think I need to say anything more about you two because I think you are global superstars. And uh, so, so I, I can't, but, but I did, what I realized uh, today is I think I have known both of you, each of you, for longer than you've known each other. Yes. So I knew Justin before he met Caroline, and I also knew, I knew Caroline, and I, actually I knew Caroline before you met Justin. And actually, Caroline, I knew your parents um, even before I met you. Because uh, you're, Indeed. and tell us, tell us a bit about your family, because your dad, Douglas Eaton, was on the Kensington Chelsea Council with my mother. And one of my earliest memories is them coming to dinner in our home. No, so no, that, I don't think I knew that. <laughs> but we met uh, Nikki. I think um, we were in a Bible study group together yes. when I was just exploring. Um, yep. I didn't know which way was up, and you were there uh, on the day that I became a Christian. So yes, yeah. I remember it so well. So, Carol, how did that happen? I mean, how did you get to that? That it was in Sandy Miller's house, wasn't it, in Onslow Square? But what brought you there? Um, my sister and uh, my sister was a student in Durham and um, she had met Sandy and uh, she was a Christian and I was about to go to university and I was just on the edge of um, wanting to know more. I didn't think I could do that. I thought it was all about being good and trying hard. And I knew that that wasn't going to be possible. And so she brought me to a new Bible study group that Sandy had started. And he just said, it's not about, um, this is the beginning of a relationship and it doesn't matter if you fail, you know, and it just, it just changed the whole way in which I understood what uh, being a Christian was. That was the beginning. So this would be 1976? Yes. Yes. Uh, and just what happened to you that day? What, what was the experience that you had? Well, I just remember him, him saying, um, we had our eyes shut and he said, I want you to bring to mind, you know, let things come to your mind that you need to say sorry for. As that happened, he said, you know, um, you know this is a commitment God makes to you. And, um, you know, um, um, and he promises never to leave you. And it was just the most amazing relief to realise it wasn't up to me. So, so that, so did you actually meet in London, or do you meet in Cambridge? We met in Cambridge. We, he and his friends uh, used to invite a whole load of people to supper before an evangelistic um, uh, story, um, evangelistic talk. So that was your first <laughs> date. That was your first date to go to an evangelistic talk. Indeed. <laughs> you know, it's how to good, give a girl a good time. So. <laughs> and, <laughs> never, ever took me a, to a ball, I have to say. Never <laughs> took me to a ball. <laughs> Your mum is the most amazing person. I mean, Jane, Lady, what, Lady Williams, Jane Williams, uh, was Jane Paul. I mean, she is the... Uh, she comes, of course, to, to one of the um, HDB sites and uh, she's the most wonderful, wonderful person. She was in the car, wasn't she, with Winston Churchill. Uh, to correct me if this story's wrong, what I've heard is that when, uh, when the king died, yes. and so Queen Elizabeth II 
were, uh, became the Queen of England and had to come back from her foreign travels. Winston, she went with Winston Churchill to the airport and Winston Churchill was apparently, I, what I've been told, Winston Churchill was, was weeping and so was your mother um, as they went to the airport. Um, well, he, to meet... he, they drove out to the airport and in those days the Prime Minister had one detective, so they had the detective in the car and there was uh, the driver and my mother and, and um, Churchill and he was dictating as they drove the speech that he would give uh, to the House of Commons on the death of the king and on um, uh, the accession of, of the queen. And it was a great speech. And um, she, he was in tears, she was in tears, the driver was in tears, the detective was in tears. I mean, <laughs> it, was, it was quite something. And, and there's that famous photograph of the queen. Yes, I've seen it. On yeah. the steps. Yeah. Of the aircraft. She flown back from Kenya. And just at the top of the steps, and at the bottom of the steps, these line the cabinet, a line of old men, and this remarkable young woman. Extraordinary. And he uh, and my mother was standing just next to the photographer when he took that picture. Um so, yes, one of many extraordinary memories. And there are other things that I, you know, that comes up and says, oh, I remember that. And, Amazing. And, and I say, tell me about it. She says, no, I can't. I signed the official secret tag. You know? <laughs> <laughs> She's very discreet. You two met up in, in Cambridge. You got married. And and when you, you did some quite exciting things, and you went off and kind of smuggled Bibles behind the Iron Curtain and all kinds of things. Caroline, tell us about those times. Um, so this little organisation was based in Holland and we knew some people. Justin had already spent a summer there. He had already committed to go to somewhere in Eastern Europe, uh, which, of course, in those days, um, uh, the Iron Curtain and Bibles... Uh, in very short supply, if at all, and a lot of persecution of Christians. You had to learn where you were going. You couldn't take any addresses with you. And um, we took little camper vans with secret compartments. I mean, it sounds terribly cloak and dagger. It was, it was quite, quite, you were sort of on, on the edge and praying hard as you went. It was dangerous. It. it was a dangerous thing to do in those days. You could get arrested. Yes, but it was much more dangerous for the people in those countries who were putting their lives literally at risk and their families' lives at risk by being willing to receive things. We would have had an uncomfortable few hours and then we would have just been expelled. Um, but it was a very, it was, it was a very um, um, growing couple of seasons that we did that. And, Presumably um, they were very grateful to get the Bibles. They were. They were. We, we took the second time we took Christian literature because that was in, in even less supply, wasn't it? It was. And I mean, it's hard to recollect for us now. These were not slightly authoritarian regimes. This was totalitarian communism. Mm -hmm. And they had at many times stopped churches meeting. Uh, they prohibited the printing or distribution of Bibles. They arrested church pastors. They forbade anything to do with work with youth or children. Um, it was a, they were cruel, very dark and wicked regimes. I was reading um, your the first major biography of Archbishop Justin Welby by Andrew. And he, and he says that when you were in one of your parishes, you were known as Mr. Alpha. I would love to see, I would love to see that almost except in the most unusual circumstances, every church gathering, whether whatever it is, has something like Alpha 
and um, Alfred's the one I know best. Um, so that people who are inquiring about what it means to be a Christian, where God has begun to warm their hearts, can find a way, a safe place to ask, ask every question they want without ever being judged and to hear the Christian faith laid out before them in a way that is really clear, very straightforward and accessible and relevant to them. And I think from my point of view, the, the genius of Alpha is that it's been done in the smartest churches in England. It's been done in the poorest churches in England. I even taught Maasai leaders how to do Alpha hmm. at one point in Tanzania. Wow. But it leads you to expect to develop a relationship with God in Jesus Christ. And that is something God does perfectly for every human being. It, it, God is the ultimate bespoke maker of lives. They are never mass produced. They're never off the peg. They are perfect for every single human being. And, and somehow, particularly with the Holy Spirit day or weekend or whatever you do, somehow people meet with God in Christ so beautifully and powerfully and transformingly at that time. Uh, and, and so who wouldn't do that? I mean, why not? Mm. And um, fast forward, 2013, you're being what is it what is it enthroned enthroned in canterbury cathedral you were so sweet you you very i had the huge privilege of staying with you um when that happened and i, I it was an unforgettable moment you know you're surrounded by all those bishops with prince charles and all the other sort of establishment and and everybody else um there and a wonderful wonderful moment um and i remember you saying that the anointing followed the appointing, or you didn't maybe use that expression, but that was basically what you were saying, um, something yeah. along those lines. Funnily enough, we never, it was so unlikely that I'd be appointed. I'd been a bishop only, I mean, when I was announced, I'd been a bishop just on 12 months and a week or something, two weeks or something like that. And um, uh, I'd been in post uh, as a Darson bishop for 11 months or something like that. And so it was really ridiculous. Why are you still, you know, why are you still, you're not just, I mean, you're not just in these positions, but you are still telling people the good news about Jesus. And, and why should someone who's listening to this right now put their faith in Jesus? I would say, well, that 45 years ago in a few months, I put my life in the hands of Jesus Christ and asked him to be Lord of my life. Something happened. I wasn't even sure I believed in God. But he came into my life. And through all that's happened since, he has always been there, calling me back when I run away, strengthening me when I'm weak, teaching me, rebuking me, searching me, leading me. And in this extraordinary adventure, as Caroline said, of the last eight years, this extraordinary adventure, and despite all the folderol and the ups and downs and the horrendous attacks in the press sometimes and yeah. other people saying, oh, how important you are, all that stuff, that's nothing to do with it. At its heart is what I know each morning as I pray in the early morning as I tell him I love him and I find afresh his love for me, his forgiveness, his grace, 
his assurance that whether I'm successful or a failure, he does not change at all. And for the evidence, there is the historic reality of the fact that someone called Jesus lived, that he was crucified during the governorship of Pontius Pilate, and the indisputable fact that he rose physically from the dead and that his frightened and terrified followers within a month or so were out on the streets telling people about the God who visited them and changed them. So there's that historical side, there's the growth of the church, but most of all, there's the fact that I meet him every day. Wonderful. Thank you both so much. Honestly, such a privilege um, to have you both and, and such profound wisdom and um, amazing, amazing that God has raised you up for such a time as this. Thank you, Nikki. Lord Jesus, we pray for leaders in your church. We thank you for Archbishop Justin and Caroline Welby and pray that you would continue to give them wisdom and courage to lead well. We pray also for other leaders in our city and nation. Help them to make decisions which save others and fill them with your Holy Spirit that they might lead by following you. Amen. Almighty God, we pray for those who are living on their own through this pandemic and those who feel as if they are doing this alone carrying burdens single-handed. Strengthen them, comfort them. May they know your presence with them, now and always. Amen. Almighty God, we thank you for the science of hope in this pandemic. We thank you for the path out of lockdown to which the government have set out. We trust you and we pray that you would bring us out of this pandemic quickly. We pray for an end to the sickness and pain and instead replace it with your healing, your hope and your life. In Jesus' name, Amen. As lockdown starts to ease, the social and economic challenges facing vulnerable people continue to grow. Through Love Your Neighbour, we want to demonstrate God's love for them in their time of need. It's not just about handing out crisis provision. It's about supporting people over time to regain control over their lives and realise their God-given potential. At HTB, we're helping individuals and families in financial stress by offering debt advice through Crosslight and supporting people without jobs into employment through Spear and Rework. Through our shelter, we are helping homeless people into housing and caring for people who are just leaving prison. As well as working at HDB, we continue to support thousands of churches and other charities in London and across the UK. Here's just one example of the help that churches are giving. Over lockdown, I was put on furlough. There's a lot of people in my house and we were drinking almost every day. I was in a really bad place mentally and was very depressed and I eventually lost that job and was made redundant. That's when I had a phone call from the Spear programme through St Peter's Church. I didn't want to do it at first and I said no, but the coaches convinced me. All of the positive feedback and encouragement from the coaches and the rest of the trainees has really helped me become more confident. At the start of Spear, I wouldn't even speak and now I'm very confident speaking to anyone. I stopped doing drugs and drinking as much and started antidepressants. And now I have a job supporting delivery of COVID-19 vaccinations. This is what God is about. This is why the church is here. The vision for our communities is large and there is so much we can do. Please help by donating or volunteering at hdb.org forward slash love your neighbour. Love your neighbour. We're in this together.
Today, I want to talk to you about freedom in Jesus. Romans chapter 8, verse 1 to 3 reads, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. I didn't grow up going to church. I wasn't a Christian. Um, In fact, my only experience of religion was during my RE lessons at school. I grew up with my mum and to be honest, home life was unpredictable. She struggled with alcoholism and found herself in and out of abusive relationships. I didn't feel safe a lot of the time and I felt really alone. When I was about 16 years old, I was invited to a youth club that just happened to be in a church not too far from my house. I went and I would go every Thursday night Over time, um, the, the people who invited me became my friends and soon they became like family to me. I started to go with them on Sundays and as the years went on, they moved away for school or with family. And I found that I continued to go. I came because of the community, but I stayed because of the friendship that I found in Jesus. The book of Romans is one of my favorite books and I think it's because it lays out so beautifully and powerfully the freedom and the friendship that we can all have access to with God through Jesus. When reading Romans chapter eight, um, a few things that stood out to me and firstly is verse one where it says, therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. When we start a sentence with therefore, the implication is that something went before it. Something has happened. The body of the story has been told. And and now with this knowledge, we, we move forward towards a conclusion. And Paul says that this conclusion is immediate. It's now. He says, right now, in this very moment, we are free to live our lives fully, regardless of what has been spoken over us, or even regardless of what we have spoken over ourselves. God continues to free us right now because there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And the Greek word for the word no in in this passage is uden. And uden more closely translates to no one. There There were days where I would go to school wearing trainers. And we all know that you cannot go to school in trainers, you know, unless you have a good reason. So there was one way to get away with wearing trainers. And that was to have a note in your planner from your mom or your dad or whoever looked after you. And, and this note was like, you know, it protected you. A little bit of me was like, go on, say something, you know, because I knew that no one could tell me anything. You know, I was, I was pardoned. No one could condemn me. And Romans chapter eight, verse one is a bit like that. This is our pardon note that we get to carry around. This clearly states, no one can judge me. No one can hold what has been done to me or anything I've done in the past against me because I am pardoned, I am forgiven, I am free. There is no judgment here because there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We have been justified and justified means just as if I'd never sinned. Justification is a transaction that happens completely outside of us. If you ever need proof that God loves you, don't look at your your job or your car or your status or your house. No, look at where you've been, look at what you survived, look at where you were. 
That's how we know that we have been justified. Secondly, we are set free. Verse 2 says, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. See, the heart of the gospel message is that Jesus has died for all our sins, sins past, present and future. The passage says that Jesus was the sin offering. And what is so mind blowing about this is that he was the one person who throughout his entire life committed no sin whatsoever. But he took on all of our sin so that we could be set free. And not just free for a short while or, or just when we deserve it, but free for all time. Romans 5, 8 says, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The thing about God is that he is always finding a way to be faithful to us. No matter what we do, no matter how far we stray, he is always providing a way out for us. That is the kindness of God, that nothing can separate us from his love, not even death. Some, some friends and I went out to eat pre-COVID, um, so when we were allowed, and we were sat in this restaurant for hours. I mean, we pretty much ate every meal of the day in this place. And just as uh, we asked the waitress for the bill, she, she came to our table and she said, the bill has been paid, you're, you're free to go. I mean, I'm thinking, this is a mistake. We've literally eaten breakfast, lunch, and dinner here. We've been here for hours. Why would anyone want to cover that bill? And she couldn't answer. She said, the bill's been covered. You're free to go. And in the same way, Jesus has paid the price for you and for me. Our bill has been covered and we are free. We are free to go. John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave us his one and only son so that whoever believes in him will not die but have eternal life. For God so loved the world, not because he thought we were okay. No, because he so loved us that Jesus paid the price to set us free. We can go to God in any and every situation because the price has been paid and there is nothing that we can do to change that. There is nothing that we can do to make God love us any less or any more. The Bible says that our sins are as far as the east is from the west and that God has thrown them into the depth of the sea and that he remembers them no more. We don't have to walk around carrying this weight of guilt when God has forgiven us already. Throughout Romans, Paul writes about the ability of the spirit to overwhelm our capacity to sin. And when we accept this, the Holy Spirit comes to live in us so that we are empowered to change and to embrace this freedom. Change is possible. God can change anyone, any mindset, any circumstance. That is the beauty of the gospel. There is no situation so hopeless that it is outside of the reach of God. Isaiah 59 verse 1 says, Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save. I am not perfect, but I know someone who is, and his name is Jesus. Throughout Romans, there are constant reminders of this grace and this freedom that we get to have unlimited access to. Romans 5.20 says, where sin abounds, his grace abounds even greater. Romans 8.35, nothing shall separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Romans 8.37, in all these things through Jesus, we are more than conquerors. Romans 8.38, what? shall separate us from the love of God. Jesus has paid the price and we now have freedom. Because God so loved the world, he has given us all a way to him, a way to new life, 
a way that we could have never come up with, no matter how strong, how rich, how, how popular, how woke we are. In the death and resurrection of Jesus, we have new life and freedom. Let's invite the Holy Spirit to come as we respond to what God has been saying to us through that amazing passage in Romans. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The law of the spirit of life has set me free from the law of sin and death. Now, mm. Lord, we ask you to send your spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Mm. The law of the spirit, the Holy Spirit comes to set us free. Allow that message right now to fill your heart. If you had been the only person in the world, Jesus would have died for you, to set you free from the law of sin and death. And to enable you to be filled again today with the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And if you're feeling particularly condemned about something that's weighing on your mind, mm. this verse is for you to remember that there is no condemnation for you today. You can bring those thoughts, worries, things that have happened in the past to the Lord afresh to know and know that he has dealt with them, he has died for them, that they're washed away and that you be filled again with your spirit and set free. Mm. There's something you feel you need to be set free from today. This is the time the spirit of the Lord sets you free. For freedom, Christ has set you free. Mm. And right now, the spirit is witnessing with your spirit. giving you peace and that is evidence that the Spirit of God is testifying to you. That he's with you. There is no condemnation. You are free. In Jesus' name. Amen. How great the chasm that lay between us How high the mountain I could not climb In desperation I turned to heaven And spoke your name into the night Then through the darkness your love and kindness tore through the shadow of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living Lord.
If you're struck by something in today's service or you just love some prayer, our prayer team are available and would love to pray with you. If you're watching on htb.org, scroll down to the bottom of the screen and click on the chat function in the corner. Or if you're on YouTube or you just love emails, send us an email at prayer at htb.org. To catch the full conversation that Nikki had with the Archbishop Justin Welby and Caroline, head to Nikki's podcast. And if you've never tried Alpha, Alpha is an opportunity to explore life's big questions and you can do it online from the comfort of your own home. It's a free opportunity to gather together with other people online, go through a series of episodes together and explore the Christian faith. If you've never tried it, you'd like more information or to sign up, head to the websites on the screen right now. Churches all across the UK are doing amazing stuff to support their local communities and they need your help to continue. If you're a member of HDB, the ways to give are on the screen right now. Thanks so much for watching. Remember, you can connect with us this week over on social media. But now it's time to head over to Nicky and Pippa for the blessing. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and mm. peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen.